Well, let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. All right. It's good to see you. Praise God. We're very grateful to have another opportunity for us to study God's wonderful words of life. And I know that the Lord has something special in store for us as we continue with the thought of Lord, teach us. Lord, teach us. A few weeks ago, we were able to review the study, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because if there's ever a time where God's people really need to be acquainted with the experience of prayer, it is now. The week after that, we did, Lord, teach us how to study. Because we know that there's so much winds of doctrine, so many winds of doctrine, things that are being stated as truth, but it's not truth. In fact, I, I, I've recently discovered that I can create truth, and so you can. And so it seems that nowadays everyone says, this is my truth, and this is your truth. And I was like, wow, I didn't know we can create truth. But that seems to be the world that we're living in right now. And all along, the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we had to learn, Lord, teach me how to study. And then after that, today, we are entertaining part one of a two-part study. In other words, today we're talking about, Lord, teach us how to do what? Teach us how to witness. We are doing Teach Us How to Witness Part 1. Next week will be Part 2. And uh, I had to break it up because there's a lot to package, or shall I say unpackage. But nevertheless, God wants us to learn how to witness. When we, when we walk through the sanctuary, we know that there is prayer, there is the study, and there is the witness. That all exists in the holy place, ultimately preparing us for the most holy place experience. And so it is that God wants to teach us today some principles on how to witness. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive the word and go through this study, I would like to invite as much of us as are able to, to kneel with me in prayer. If you can't kneel, it's all right. You bow your head where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel and let's pray and let's ask God to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessing to once again hear heaven speak. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunities to study to show ourselves approved unto you, that we can be both workmen and women that need not be ashamed, for we have rightly divided your words of truth. And you teach us to ask for your spirit, because, Lord, he really is the only effectual teacher of truth. There is no power of our own that we have, but when we are anointed with your spirit, we have enough power to actually complete the work that you've given us to do. And so bless us now today as we receive of that heavenly dew. And Lord, I ask that you will ignite our minds and help it to unite with yours. And that as a result of beholding Jesus, by beholding, help us to become changed. Changed into the same image. For Lord, this is our prayer that we do ask. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul is someone that I love to study. Um, we're told in inspiration that next to Christ, he was the greatest teacher the world has ever known, is the Apostle Paul. And one of the things I realized about Paul is that when he would talk to his brothers and sisters and he would write his letters, he was very, very careful in how he would communicate, even sometimes when he had to give a correction or a rebuke. He was very careful because he wanted to make sure that he exalted truth, but at the same time, he would not wound unnecessarily the soul. And this is a lesson for all of us as ministers of the gospel. And there was a time if there was one church that Paul had to give a lot of counsel and correction to, it was the church of Corinth. There was a lot of drama that was going on in that church, some very, very uh, terrible things, things that sometimes Paul said, even the heathens haven't done this. And so you will find when you read the books of First and Second Corinthians that Paul often would give counsels and warnings and again, even corrections. It's in this vein that we arrive at Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now I want you to turn your Bibles with me there. In Second Corinthians, the 11th chapter, Paul is once again admonishing the brethren. And I like how he starts in the beginning of this chapter because again, you see that, that loving, careful nature of how he talks to his brethren, even though there are times where he has to give warning, counsel, or correction. 
The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 11. If you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 1, he says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now watch what he says in verse 3. He says, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from something very special. What is it? From the simplicity that is in Christ. Did you know, when somebody accepts the Lord Jesus Christ into their life, truly, their lives should become more simplified. Their lives should become far more simplified, much more sincerity, much more honor, much more clarity. The complex becomes more plain. When we follow God, this is why God would say things like he said, God is not the author of confusion, you know, but of peace, as in all the churches. It's, it's like God really wants that when we accept Christ, when we accept the gospel, that our lives should become more simplified. If since you've accepted Christ, your lives have become way more complex, you might want to check how you accepted him. It doesn't mean that you don't have trials. It just means that you know how through the simplicity of Christ to address the trial. This is one of the reasons why, what's my favorite book outside of the Bible? Who remembers? The book Ministry of Healing. It is the reason why I say this is because in the book Ministry of Healing, we're told that the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. That's one of the things I love is that when, when the reality is, is when I come into a church, when I go into a community, when I go into the workforce, wherever I'm going, I know that I'm going to run into a diversity of people. But the one thing that we all have in common, whether we're white, black, male, female, young or old, the one common denominator between all of us is we all have problems. Is that right? We all got problems. And what does God say? God says the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. That's what the gospel was supposed to be. When we accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is supposed to be a means by which now heaven can communicate to you and to me that now I'm going to show you how to take all the complexities and all of the challenges and all of the problems of life, and I'm going to show you the simple way of how you can address it. I gave you examples. One of the things I love, and I, and I admit, I, I love, I, I realize that to whom much is given, much is required. I really do believe that. If, if whom much is given, much is required. When I was about, I guess, about 16, 17 years old, I, I became interested in religion. I did. And the first thing I did is I said, all right, let me go ahead and start looking around. So, of course, I went to the Roman Catholic Church, and I went to the Pentecostal Church, and I went to the Baptist Church, and I was looking around because I'm on a search for God. There was an interest that was birthed within me, but I'm, I'm looking and trying to find God, even to the point that I decided to become Muslim for a little while. I said, let me go ahead and check out Islam, see what it's all about. They look so disciplined on the outside. So I said, let me see what that's about, because I need more discipline in my life. And I remember jumping around and jumping around and jumping around, and it was at the age of 20, at the height of me being a dancer and a choreographer in the hip-hop and R&B industry, working with the stars, and that's how God interrupted my path. And God allowed a series of events to take place where it stopped me in my tracks, made me pay attention to what's going on in the name of life. And I was drawn to this very interesting movement that was called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Never heard of it. 20 years of my life, never even heard of it. I was like, what is that? That's the first thing I said to the minister. When I heard that minister preach, I said, what is that? What is a Seventh-day Adventist? I never heard of that. And he was like, oh, sounds to me like you want to study. I was like, oh, yeah, I want to study. And he sent a man to my house, and the rest is history, 30 years ago. And here it is that I remember joining. And while I do not believe that I am better than anybody else as a result of being part of this movement, 
I do recognize that much has been given to this movement. And to whom much is given, much will be required. And so from that, I began to realize the gems that I would be privileged to learn from the Word of God and to understand that I said, Lord, how could I keep this to myself? So I'm talking about even before I got baptized, but certainly after, immediately I would go to strangers and say, hey, did you know? I would start going to people and say, hey, did you know this? I was one of those guys that God, God began to teach me how to come out of my shell. You might not believe it, but I used to be a super hyper shy guy. I was so shy, I couldn't even look people in the eyes. Like, I'd be very intimidated if you looked me in my eyes. I immediately would look at my feet. And I would walk around with my head down. I often would walk around like this. My father used to always say, Dwayne, pick your head up. It's like it was my safe zone of not having to look people in the eyes. But for some reason, when I came in contact with the gospel, and I started to discover this has solutions to problems that I have in my life. And what ended up happening is it created a boldness. And before you know it, the man who looked down was now the man who could look up. Before you know it, I could now go to a stranger because I actually believed that I had the pearl. And so I would actually go around to people and say, hey, did you know this? And they would look around, talking to me, and I'm like, yeah, you, did you know this? And they would say, no what? And I would say, well, look at this. And, and I would go ahead and share the word. And I found that people began to follow the God that I was following. They were following me as I was following Christ. And one of the reasons why is because they saw a lot of enthusiasm. They saw somebody that they could communicate in their minds, this brother seems to really believe his message. And the rest is quite honestly history. I've been sharing Christ for over 30 years. I've been sharing Christ. I, today, it's interesting. I've traveled all over this planet. I've been all over this country 10 times over, etc. But I still like to make time just to sit in somebody's living room that knows not the Lord and knows not his truth for this time and sit in the living room and just walk them through the scriptures. I find, I find tremendous joy in doing that and watching that light come on in their eyes when they say, oh, I've never seen that before. It's like, yeah, there's a lot more. And we just go into the word. And so God has put this burden on my heart. We need to review the gospel that we have received. Because if you and I actually have discovered how to simplify our life's problems as a result of the gospel, I believe it's going to be very difficult to keep it to yourself. Often the thing that causes us not to share Christ as much as we possibly should share Christ is because maybe that gospel has not simplified our problems. And maybe we're not fully convinced yet. And so my hope is through this study that we're going to do that God will put some fire under us and get us to that place that we realize you got something very special. You have in your hands. This is why I love the John the Revelator when he says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having. It was in his possession. He had the everlasting gospel, which is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. That's what John has. Do you believe that you have that family? That's the real question. And it's not for you to answer me, it's for you to answer your own heart. Do I really have the solution? Because I'm sorry, if you have the solution, I don't think you're gonna be timid about sharing it. If you really realize what you have, if I really realize what I have, and so, I want to go ahead and just kind of give us a reminder of some principles that I think will prove very, very helpful to us. You know, Jesus made a statement, and the statement is found here in the book of Luke, where it says, for the Son of Man is come to do what? Seek and to save that which was lost. Now, go to John 17 with me. Watch this. Understanding the great purpose that Jesus came to this world. What is the purpose Christ came to this world? To seek and to save that which was lost. Now, go to John 17. When Jesus knew that his time was coming up, and he's getting ready to go back home to the Father, but before that, to go to the grave. When Christ saw that this was coming, Jesus got to this place where he had this very special prayer time with God in John 17. We're told in inspiration that John 17 should be a chapter that we study often. 
And when Jesus was having this intercessory prayer time, it's only like verses one to four that Jesus prays for himself. The rest of the verses in the chapter, he's praying for everybody else. That was a lesson for us. We should spend more time in prayer for others than for ourselves. But watch this. In John 17, Jesus got to a point in his prayer that he said this. And I want you to catch it. It says in John 17, right there in verse 18, look at what the text says. It says, as thou, in other words, in like manner, as thou hast sent me into the world, what's the next two words? Even so have I also sent them into the world. Now, somebody could give the argument and say, well, that was just Jesus talking about the 11, that he sent them into the world as he came. But no, because by time you get to verse 20, just two verses down, when Jesus said that prayer, as I came into the world, even so I'm sending them, what does he say in verse 20? He says in verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. I think that includes you and me. Do we believe through the word of all of those whom God has sent before? Yes. So then what is Christ saying? As he was sent into the world, he's doing what with us? He's sending us into the world. And notice, how did he come? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. I love this because if you and I did not know our general, in, in, when you study inspiration, all, we have a general calling and then we have a specific calling, okay? All of us have a general calling. What is the general calling or the general purpose of our lives? It is to seek and save that which is lost. That's the general purpose. Once we accept Christ, this is why you'll, you'll read these statements where Mrs. White will say things like, there will be no starless crowns in heaven. You know, why does she make statements like that? Because if we're really Christians, we're going to do what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He went around seeking to save that which was lost. So check this out. The general calling of your life, the general calling of my life is to seek and to save that which is lost. That's clear. Now, the specific call might be through being an attorney, through being an office manager, through being a garbage collector, through being a physician, through being a business owner. But at the end of the day, whatever my calling or my profession or whatever it is, I know that I have a higher reason to show up at work than just to collect a paycheck. Are you following that? It's like you, you and I got to understand that. When I became a Christian family, I'm telling you the truth. Even when I went to work, I understood my job is a field. I would understand that thing. And I would go in there and any opportunity I could get, it didn't matter if I was talking to a manager, it didn't matter if I was talking to a supervisor. All I needed to do was see them just with their head hanging down like that. And I would say, uh-oh, might be an opportunity. And then I would go to them and say, hey, is everything okay? Eh, it's all right, you know, I just got some things on my mind. Anything you want to talk about? Well, you know, you ever had somebody, and oh man, I, I get goosebumps when they start talking, because it's like, oh yes, here we go. And then they'll say, you ever had somebody just, you know, you're trying to be kind and then they rail in on you? It's like you're trying to be nice and they just keep speaking mean to you. I say, yeah, I know what you mean. You know, I start using feel, felt, found language. I understand how you feel, I felt the same way, but here's what I found. They call that feel, felt, found. And I would say, I understand how you feel. I, I felt the same way, man. But here's what I found helped me. And now I can go ahead and say, here's what I found that helped me, but nah, maybe I shouldn't share it right now. And then they'll go ahead and say, no, 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 please share. Now I did that on purpose because I need them to ask. And then when they would say, please share, I would say, I go to Jesus. I look to his example of how he dealt with difficult people. I found in Christ that he's my pattern man. My desire is to be more like him. Are you a Christian? And immediately the conversation goes in a very beautiful direction. And he can't go around saying, I brought Christ into the workplace because he asked. Are you following that? What I'm saying, beloved, is Jesus wants us to understand that there's a general calling on yours in my life. The general calling is you are all created to seek to save that which was lost. It is what you are called in existence to do, is to make the unknown God known, like Paul did in Acts 17. But 
What is the specific place? Oh man, that's a, that's a bunch of different areas of life. It's just remember, if you're called to be a doctor, you are called to be a missionary doctor. If you are called to be a nurse, you are called to be a missionary nurse. If you're called to be a businessman, you are called to be a missionary businessman. That's the point that God wants to get across. But we're all called to seek and to save that which was lost. But we can't be assumptive. We can't assume that we get this. So we need to break this down. We need to entertain the question, what does it mean to be lost? I don't want to go looking for the wrong thing. Neither should you. So let's say, let's say we respond to the call of God. Let's say we agree with Jesus. All right, Lord, you came to seek and save that which was lost. I'm going to go and seek that which is lost. You ready to go? But you remember, wait a minute. What does it really mean to be lost? I, I, I don't, maybe I don't get that. And I've asked people, what does it mean to be lost? And you get a diversity of answers. I think we should let the Bible describe it. What do you say? So watch this. What does it mean to be lost? You'll remember there was a story. A story in the scripture that I think gets the point across. In the scriptures, there is a story of a family. And a family gets a little broken up. And the son makes it very clear, Father, give me all my goods. To me, you're dead. So the reward that I would have gotten at your death, I want it now. It was a terrible insult to his father. But the father was not caught up in his self-injury. The father was caught up in his wounded son. And so here it is that the father accommodates the son and says, all right, I'll go ahead and give you your inheritance. He squanders it, messes everything up, but he remembers his dad. You see, it's very important that if our children dare to go into rebellion or about to go into rebellion, let's make sure that we put good memories in their mind before they took off, whether they spiritually leave or whether they physically leave. Because the Bible says in the story of the prodigal son, it says he remembered his father. He remembered his father's love. He knew that his father was broken about his son leaving, but there's something that that father communicated to the son through love that that, that son remembered, if I repent, I can come back. Make sure that your children never leave thinking my father hates me. Make sure your children never leave the home thinking my mother can't stand me. Let's make sure we are very careful and prayerful about the impressions we give on the minds even of our rebellious youth. Well, here it is that that boy remembered. And he remembered and he said, man, my father, at least he'll give me a position possibly with the servants. So he's on his way back home. When he's on his way back home, you remember the story, the remaining son, the faithful son, that, you know, he's like, dad, what are you doing? You're throwing a party and all this other stuff. He left. If anything, I should be getting this party. And what did the father say? The father said, for this, my son was what? Dead and is what else? Alive again. And he was lost and is found. Now, you know, when we, they, they, when we did Lord Teach Us How to Study, I didn't get into the breakdown of the many methods of studying the Bible. You know, getting into contextual reading, cross-referencing, typology. There's a lot of ways you can study the Bible. This is one of them. It's called parallelism. It's making one point, but it's expressing it in two or more ways. There's something that's being paralleled in the verses. Let's find out. When it says, for this my son was dead, what is being paralleled with dead? Being lost. And then he says, and is alive, what's being paralleled with alive? Found. So we just answered part of our question. To be lost is to be dead. So that means we now need to go to the nearest cemetery and start doing some witnessing. Is that right? Now we're going to go ahead to tombstones and start saying, get up in the name of Jesus. No, we're not going to do that. In other words, watch what I'm saying. This is obviously speaking in a spiritual context. It's not dealing with literal dead because the dead know not anything. So obviously, this is speaking to those who are spiritually dead. Are you following that? So when we talk about the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost, and we are to do the same, that means that we are looking for those who are spiritually dead so that they can be found and become alive. Are we following so far? Good. Well, what does it mean to be spiritually dead? I think that deserves some more explanation. What does it mean to be spiritually dead? Let's notice what the Bible says. 
in Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened, which means, by the way, to make alive. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Continuing in Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. And then Colossians 2 and verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When we look at these verses, seeking to understand what does it mean to be spiritually dead, here is our summary. Our summary is to be spiritually lost is to be spiritually dead. The spiritually dead is someone who lives in a lifestyle of sin and is powerless to overcome it. That's who you're trying to seek out. People who are living in a lifestyle of sin and have no way out. There's nothing they can do because the dead can do nothing. When we're in sin, we can do nothing against those sins. We can't overcome it. We can't be delivered from it. We can't be saved from it, except there is some intervention, some help. So Jesus makes it clear. The people that he came seeking out ultimately to save were people who were living in a lifestyle of sin and powerless to overcome it. And he came to deliver them from that lifestyle. So in like manner. When you and I go throughout this world, when we accept Christ, Jesus says, all right now, I'm calling you now to go seek and to save or deliver those who are spiritually dead, those who are living in a lifestyle of sin and powerless to overcome it. I want you to introduce them to power that you can help them to overcome. That could be someone's husband. That could be someone's wife who's a member of the church, who's a deacon or an elder or a pastor or a deaconess. You got to look carefully, beloved. And that's why once we're done with the Lord Teach Us studies, my next series of studies with us is Lord Save Our Homes. That's the next series of studies that I'm going to be doing whenever I preach from this desk. Because if there's one thing I've understand about the devil is he loves to get to the heart of the matter. He attacks the heart. Everything I read in the Bible, Satan always attacks the heart. And the heart of the community, the heart of society, the heart of the church is the home. Satan would love for us to preach a bunch of good letters while we have broken homes because he knows there's no power in that. The world responds to power. They don't care how much noise people make. They care about how powerful is the noise. That's the world we live in. I look back at that. I was look, look, looking over some documentaries not long ago about the civil rights movement and all these things. And, and as I was going through it, it didn't matter if it was Dr. King. It didn't matter if it was Malcolm X. It didn't matter who it was. The reason why these brothers were people that, want, that many wanted to be taken out is because they saw the effect of their work. They don't care if you're saying stuff. You can say whatever you want. What they're paying attention to is, are people listening? And are people making changes? And the more that people listen, and the more that people make change, that's when drama is definitely going to come. But if we're just making noise, but we're not really impacting Folsom, the devil says, we're not worried about them. They just, they just make, they, they sound like sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. But let us start working in the community of Folsom. Let us start seeing homes transform. Let us start seeing people leave some of these big churches. I told you, I said, I, 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 I scoped out the churches in this area. I got the names of the pastors and their assistant pastors and everybody else. Let us go ahead and let some of those members start telling their pastors, well, we learned some things about Babylon and Bible prophecy, and we have to continue to follow the Lord. And you watch how this little Granite Bay Folsom group is going to suddenly blow up and get a whole lot of attention. The devil is afraid of power. He's not afraid of noise. And what God is trying to say is he wants us to go beyond making noise. Even if it's good noise, even if it's good sounds, where's the power at? And so it is that Christ says, this is what I've called my people to do. Now, here's some good news. The good news is people are waiting for us. This great work that we're called to do to seek and save that which was lost, 
people are waiting for us. Let me prove it. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Watch what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew, the ninth chapter, I'm going to prove biblically that people are waiting for us. Sometimes you hear people say, where are the souls? We can't find them. Are you kidding me? I'm going to tell you to do exactly what Jesus told the people to do. Look up. You'll see. The Bible says in Matthew 9, let's go ahead and consider verses 37 and 38. Matthew 9, we're looking at verses 37 and 38. The people are waiting for us, beloved. They're not merely waiting for God, they're waiting for us. Matthew 9, notice what it says in verses 37 and 38. The Bible says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is what? Plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now let's stop right there. When we, how, many, how many farmers do we have in the room? Do we have any farmers here? Oh my, no farmers. All right. Well, I think even if you're not a farmer, you can get this question. Harvest is plenteous. Does the harvest time represent the beginning of the planting season or the end of the planting season? Which one is it? It's the end. So notice, the harvest. Jesus did not say the field. He did not say the garden. He, was, he spoke with specificity. He said the harvest is plenteous. Now, when it's harvest time, do you know what you have to do as a farmer? When it's harvest time, just reap. <laughs> That's all you do is you just reap. You just reap. Why? Because the planting process is over. It's re everything's ready now. So just reap. That's what you do in a harvest time. That's why when you read Revelation 14 at the end of the third angel's message, it says, now the time has come for thee to reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Revelation 14, 15. So harvest time represents a time where all you got to do is just come grab it. That's good news for those of us who feel like winning souls is too much work. It's like, hold on, the harvest is plenteous. Not the garden, not the field, the harvest is plenteous. But what's the problem? Lack of laborers. Seems like God knows that there's still not enough people cooperating with him in seeking to save that which is lost because the harvest is plenteous. Now, continuing in verse 38, it says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. This verse 38 is a very practical verse, especially for pastors. It's especially for ministers. It says, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You know how most pastors and ministers read verse 38? I'm going to show you how most pastors and ministers read verse 38. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Therefore, work as hard as you can and kill yourself so that you can do all the harvesting. That's how a lot of ministers read verse 38. Do you know how many pastors are going through burnout? Do you know how many ministers of the gospel are suffering all sorts of horrible diseases and all these things because they're overworking their systems? They overwork their minds. They overwork their bodies, often more mind than body. And we overwork and overwork. We got to answer the call of all the saints. And God help you if you have a big church, because that's more saints that you got to answer the call. And what ends up happening is the ministers become intemperate. And we don't just work, we overwork, we overdo it. Did you know the servant of the Lord says that too much brain work without enough physical work imbalances the nervous system? Too much brain work and not enough physical work imbalances the nervous system. Do you know what you can get if, you, if your nervous system is imbalanced chronically, like over a long period of time, think about all of the diseases that are directly connected to the nervous system. Think about neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. Think about all of these diseases that are directly connected with something going wrong in the nervous system. And then you start looking at what are a lot of the pastors already being diagnosed with? A lot of them are going through these very things. Why? Because we misunderstood verse 38. Verse 38 did not say, work until you die. Work until you can work no more. Get the work finished all by yourself. The verse said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send more laborers. 
and do what little you can. That's actually the counsel of heaven. Do what little you can. Don't do a little when you can do more, but just do your part. And then let everything else fall in place as you're praying the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers. So the reality is, is that God is saying, look, people are waiting. The harvest is plenteous. John 4, let's turn there. John 4, you remember, that's the story of the woman at the well. In John 4, notice what Jesus says to the disciples again. John 4 and verse 35. Watch what Christ says again. Beautiful point. In John 4 and verse 35, the Bible says it like this. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Family, there are people all over Folsom that's waiting for us. They're like harvest time. They're ready to be reaped. The problem is the lack of laborers. That's the issue. Inspiration says it like this. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, and for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. God says, listen, folks, People are waiting to be gathered in. They're all around us. This is why the next time you stop at the gas station, pray. Lord, do you want me to talk to this person right now that's right across from me putting gas in their car? God may say that's one of the people that's waiting to be gathered in. The next time you go to the bank and you have to do that transaction, pray, Lord. Is this something you want me to say to Mary or to John today? Because now is the time. Just at least pray, Lord, is it time to say something to that person that I keep seeing every morning that as I'm pulling out my driveway, we always go beep, beep, all right. It might be that God may say, stop, say something to them. I will put my words in your mouth. God wants us to understand harvest, plenteous. Laborers, few. That's the issue. Now, understanding this, the Bible gives us some powerful points here. Knowing that we are surrounded by people that are waiting. We are surrounded by people that want what we have. They want their lives more simplified. You think people could, could do with some simplification of their lives? You think some people can benefit from that today? You better believe it. Now, the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. So I guarantee you, you have the key. You have the pearl. I have the key. I have the pearl. We have it. We just need to realize it. Let it work on our behalf. And now go fulfill what Christ says here. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 14, and Isaiah 43 and verse 10, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Isaiah says it like this, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God for him, and neither shall there be after me. Christ makes it very clear, you are my witnesses. I've raised you up to be a witness to all of those people that are looking for me but can't find me. And he's called us to be these witnesses because he knows what we have is better than what they have. Don't let the world lie to you. Don't, don't buy the front. Remember, we're living in a social media age. We, lying is lifestyle today. Everybody will go ahead and, and they go ahead and make it look like I'm happy and then post it when they're miserable, when they're sad. Can't believe the lie, family. You got to pray. You got to be able to say, Lord, maybe these people aren't as happy as they're making themselves look. There are people looking for what you have. Do not believe the lie of Satan that everybody else is happy and we as God's people are miserable. I get it. 
we have not given the best witness one to another. I get that. We're going to talk about that. So sometimes, especially our young generation, they look and they say, look, if the gospel's working so much, why is it that this, the church is filled with a bunch of miserable older people? These are questions that they ask. These folks look mad all the time. They come to church every Sabbath. They can barely smile. And if they smile, all you got to do is keep looking at them. And they do stuff like this. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and you, you, don't think they, you don't think they caught when that smile disappeared? Our young people are like computers on fiber optic network speed. Their minds are downloading very fast. And they're paying attention. They see when we went, hi. They're seeing all of that stuff. And they're like, I don't think these people are really happy. The one thing I love about my young brothers and sisters, man, I'm serious, is they are a keep it real generation. That's, I could work with young people any day of the week. They're a very keep it real generation. They're going to keep it real with you. They're going to be honest. This is how I feel. This is what I think. And what are you going to say about it? They want to see what are you going to do. And if you can be real with them and be honest with them and meet them where they're at, man, you could win a lot of these young people. Those young people got fire in them. That's why I can't wait for this Amazing Facts event next week where we're going to put this conference on for all these young folks to help them see you are God's last day warriors. That's my final message next Saturday evening is we're going to talk about how you're God's last day warriors. You are God's arrows. God is going to use young people to be attack weapons against the devil's kingdom, guaranteed. And it's all about who wants to be part of God's team. But we must get to that precious place to realize God has called me to be a witness, not just one who attends church. All this church hopping, we're selfish, beloved. I'm just, I'm just talking to you a little straight. We're very selfish. We come to church just, what's in it for me? What am I going to get? It's like the church is not about what you can get. I'm not saying that you shouldn't get something. You should get something. The priest should offer fresh bread every Sabbath. That was taught in the sanctuary. You shouldn't be giving those stale sermons, you know, just corny lollipop messages with no substance. No, that is not due in the sanctuary. No. But at the same time, family, we got to recognize that we come to church for way more than just simply what can I get. We should come to church with the attitude of what can I give. That should be the attitude. We're hopping around all over the place and going nowhere. Pick a church, stay at the church, and work the community. Be about Christ's business and not all the other stuff. Now, Christ made it clear. I called you to be witnesses, right? Let's break it down a little bit. What does the word witness mean, right? When I looked up the word witness, it is to, give, it is to present something evidential, something to be testified. You heard Pastor Rod so eloquently Explain it so clear even a child could get it. To testify of what you've seen and what you heard, right? To tell, to make known, to give evidence of the message that you're giving. This is what it means to be a witness. And so, as every time I preach, I, I love having some helpers. So I want you to see this for yourself. Three ways to witness according to the explanation of what the word witness means. The first way to witness is to preach is to preach the word, okay? Let's go ahead and have our reader, Mark 16 and verse 15. Who is our reader for Mark 16 and verse 15? Slip your hand up. All right, there we go. Mark 16 and verse 15. Here goes our first reader. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Amen. Notice to proclaim the good news. If you're using King James, it actually says preach right? To proclaim the good news. So the first thing is to proclaim as a herald. This is one way we can be a witness for God, is to proclaim as a herald, something that's like an announcement to let the people know who God is and what he wants us to know. The second way that we can witness is to teach. Let's go ahead and have our next reader, Matthew 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Who's our reader for that? All right, very good. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So notice that it's not just merely proclaiming as a herald when we think about witnessing, but it's also teaching, which is to instruct one as a pupil. So it's not enough to just give a sermon. Sermons are good for stimulus. 
Teaching is necessary for follow-up. Are you following that? Are you getting that? A sermon can go but so long. So a sermon is good to stimulate the mind to say, I need to study that more. I need to look deeper into that. That's what the sermons are really, really good for. But after the sermons, we need a teacher now. The teacher takes that message and now walks you through step by step at your pace so you can understand what you're learning. So that's another way we witness. It's not merely preaching, but also teaching. What's the third way that we witness? Demonstration. Demonstration. This gives power to the previous two. Can we have our reader please take 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 4. Now watch this. Very important, beloved. Lord, teach us how to witness. Watch this. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in witness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enhancing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstrations of the spirit and of power. Notice that Paul did not limit his gospel messages to merely preaching and teaching, but he demonstrated it. He would live it out. He would go ahead and start showing. Now, let me show you what these messages looks like in the life of a soul. And Paul would begin to demonstrate the gospel, manifest or make known. I looked up all of these words in the original, and this is what comes out. Preaching is to proclaim as a herald. Teaching, to instruct one as a pupil. Demonstration, to manifest or to make known. This is all what God has called us to do when we think about witnessing, to preach, to teach, and I would dare say, most importantly, to demonstrate. Now watch this. A key to successful witnessing. You know, one of the things I love about our studies is we always look at Jesus. You know, and I, and I hope you never get tired or bored as a child of God looking at Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So when we did Lord teach us to pray, we looked at how Christ prayed. When we looked at Lord teach us to study, we looked at how Jesus studied. Now we're talking about Lord teach us how to witness. So who do you think we should look to to learn how to witness? Jesus himself. There was something I could not help but to notice with Christ. <laughs> It really, it touched my heart. I said, man, okay, Lord, I want that. I want that. Please, Father, show me how I can have that. Watch this. Four instances where Jesus did something. You know we can exhaust this thing, so this is definitely not an exhaustive study. I'm just showing you some key points, and like I said, sermons make you think and then go deeper. That's what I'm hoping you will do from this sermon, all right? Number one. There was this time that Jesus was speaking. What does the Bible say? It says, and they were astonished at his doctrine or his teachings, for his word was with what? His words had power. You ever, you ever gave the word and felt powerless? You ever gave the word and it seems like it's having no effect on the hearts of the listeners? It seems like Jesus, when he would speak, even if people uh, refuted or did not fully follow what he said, they couldn't deny, man, Something about the way he speaks, it has so much power behind it. That's what we want. Continuing now, it says in Matthew 7 and verse 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When the scribes would speak, people would fall asleep, just be like, you know, these guys, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, it didn't have any weight to it. But for some reason, when Jesus would speak, it's like people would listen and say, I don't know why, but there's something about the way he's saying it that it has this degree of authority that compels me to think about what I just heard and possibly even to follow it. Continuing, it says in Luke 4, tell me if you ever did this here at, at Folsom. It says, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And then the next, and then it says, and the eyes of them all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Do you know all Jesus did was give scripture reading? That's all he did. Now, how many of you have ever seen somebody come up here at Folsom 
and say, okay, our scripture reading is, and then they give the scripture reading, and then when they say, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word, and as they're walking back to their seat, have any of you ever done this where you're like, I mean, your eyes are just fastened on them as they're walking back to their seat after so mightily just giving the scripture reading. Have any of you ever done that? <laughs> you know, I'm serious. All Jesus did, listen carefully, beloved. Go through Luke 4, read the story. All Jesus did was come into the synagogue, grab the scroll, which was common. And he grabbed the scroll, and then he opened it up, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, etc., etc., etc. And the Bible says all their eyes were fastened on it. There was something about the way he read the scripture that seemed to indicate more. Because this happened before he said what he said. A lot of people, if you, if you know Luke 4, verse 21, Christ said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ear. But he didn't say that yet in verse 20. So all he did was he read the text. But for some reason, everybody's eyes are fixed on him, and he took, he capitalized on that. He said, well, since y'all are staring at me, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ear. And then the next verse says they were astonished at how he read the verse and so on. Again, I'm looking at the life of Christ. I'm like, Lord, if you just speak to people, if you're instructing people, even if you are simply reading these words, it seems like you are having an impact on the people's minds that's very different than what we see on an average basis. Then the last one that I wanted to put up here. Man, those Pharisees hated Jesus, because remember, Jesus had power. We obviously see that. Jesus had so much power, he convinced the people. He caused change, and that's what invoked the hatred of the Pharisees. Well, here it is that when Christ was doing what he's doing, the Pharisees got some soldiers together and said, look, go arrest Jesus. Go arrest him. Can't stand this man. Arrest him. Those soldiers, yes, sir, and they go ahead and they show up to where Jesus is. The Bible says that as they came to arrest Christ. Now, you have to keep in mind that I'm, I'm thinking through the text. I'm thinking these guys are determined. If they know anything about Christ, they should know he's innocent. But nevertheless, they're ignoring that, and they're just going to go and they're going to arrest him. That's clear. And I'm thinking to myself, if they're going to arrest him, they're, they're ready. When you have to arrest somebody, if anybody's a police officer or did any type of security work, when you have to apprehend someone, you kind of have to psych your mind up. You know, you got to get your mind ready to, to you know, grab somebody. Or, or maybe if his disciples get in the way, we got to get into a fight. Back in the days, this is very much B.C. for me. But back in the days, I got a phone call from one of my boys. And he said, Dwayne. We got a problem over at such and such a place. And they said, you know, uh, it's, gonna, we're gonna go, it's gonna go down. They was like, we need you to come right now. So I understood I am going to get into a fight. So I got in the car with a few friends. We took some of our music and we said, turn it up to full volume. We turned that music up so the beat is just da doom, da doom, da doom. And I mean, and, and we would take our hoods, if we were wearing hoodies, and we would take our hoods and put it over our head and we would just bop our heads and listening to the music, and we were psyching ourselves up. We were getting ourselves upset. We were getting ourselves mad because we knew we're about to fight. We can't come out this car like, hi, everybody. We have to come out this car like, all right, let's go. So when we came out of that car, we literally came out like, where are they at? And, and we're, we're ready now to go ahead and get into a war. When you know you're going into a hostile situation, you prepare your mind for it. So here it is, these soldiers are coming and they're getting ready to nab Jesus. They're getting ready to grab him. And Jesus comes out and he says, you will look for me, but you will not be able to find me. For where I am going, you cannot go. And the Bible says that they heard that and they all left. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, how did he do that? How could Jesus just say some words to these brothers? And here it is that they took off. They come back empty-handed. They come back empty-handed. The Pharisees are like, why didn't you arrest him? The best answer that they could come up with, the Bible says, the officers answered, never a man spake like this man. That's the best answer they could give. We've never heard anybody speak like him. 
So I'm trying to figure this out. I'm like, Lord, we have a message. When we think about witnessing, right, we have a message. Preach, teach. We have a message we have to give. We have to testify, tell the people what we saw and what we heard. We have a message. But here it is that Jesus, he had a message that would stop angry people in their tracks, that would arrest the attention of his hearers. And the list goes on. And I'm thinking to myself, Father, how could I be such an effective witness for you? And here's what I found. You want to know why Christ's words had so much power? Because we have a message. The Bible is very clear. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, saying with a loud voice, we have a message that we need, that we need to say. But how can I have this arresting power impact like Jesus had when he witnessed and gave his messages. Here's what I found, beloved. Are you ready? My favorite book, next to the Bible. It gave a comment on that last story about those soldiers. And here's what it said. The officers who were sent to Jesus came back with the report that never a man spoke as he spoke. Watch this. But the reason for this was that never a man lived as he lived. Now watch the part in red. Had his life been other than it was, he could not have spoken as he did. That's how we witness. Jesus' words had power because his words was consistent with his life. Is it possible that sometimes our words don't have transforming power because maybe our words and our life are not matching up? You see, it says his words bore with them a convincing power. Isn't that what you want? When you witness for the Lord, what do you want to do? You want to convince the people. Isn't that right? You want to convince them. You want them to be convinced that what this messenger just said is true. I need to follow that, right? But look at what it says. His words bore with them a convincing power because, watch this, they came from a heart pure and holy, full of love and sympathy, benevolence, and truth. When I read this, I said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Seriously, family, I said, Father, I don't want to be one of these folks that's just in the church for years and decades, and at the end of the day, while I preach to others, I myself end up a castaway. I want to cooperate with God. I want him to have dominion. I want him to have complete control of my life, my attitude, not just to the people who are nice to me, but the people who are really, really not nice to me. Lord, I want to love how you love. Do you know that Jesus, when he talked to Pharisees, his heart was full of love for them? They were, some of them were his bona fide enemies, but his heart was full of love for them. You see, for us, Christianity is not acting. We know that. God says, I want you to really receive this thing in your heart. He says that a lot in the Bible, Old and New Testament. I want this in your heart. I want this in your heart. You see, witnessing is not about, let's come up with the latest gimmicks on how to win people. Today, there are some people that will tell you the best way to witness is to compromise all the truths that have been established on the sweat, blood, and tears of not only the pioneers, but also the apostles and Christ himself. Let's start picking up all this new stuff. Now again, I'm not, I don't have a problem with, with new things. Like today, I have no problem going with a young person and saying, let's create a TikTok video for the Lord. I have no problem with that, none. Use technology for good. 
There's nothing wrong with using some new ideas, but it must not compromise principle, truth, and standard. And God is trying to make a point to us to say, look, it's not that we got to come up, because some of these ways that people are witnessing for the Lord is bringing in numbers like the mixed multitude. I don't read anything where Jesus said, go ye therefore and preach the gospel and make numbers. We are to make disciples. And disciples have to be taught. They have to be instructed. I can't just do some sermon and tell the musician, keep playing so you could hypnotize them with your music so they can make an emotional decision to say, I need to get baptized. And then we just go ahead and baptize them. And they're like, what did I just join? It's a true story of a pastor who went and Dallas, Texas, went and preached the gospel, gave the message. He was a compromising man, and he decided, don't go through all the 27 fundamental beliefs. Don't, don't even do the 13 baptismal vows. He said, just do the three, and, and, and he just did his thing and, and just gave his own interpretation on those three vows and hardly taught the man anything and baptized him. Not only did he baptize him, he made the brother a deacon like two months later check it out. Made the man a deacon. The man becomes a deacon. He's very excited. Oh boy, pastor, I can't believe it. I'm serving in the church. I'm, you know, happy. And he said, pastor, I'm so excited. I want to invite you to my house for dinner, for lunch, Sabbath lunch. The pastor said, oh, that's wonderful. I'd love to come. Pastor went to his house and that man sat pastor down, said, pastor, I got a meal for you. He says, I raise my own hogs. And he says, I'm about to serve you some of the best pork chops that you've ever had in your life. That pastor practically choked on his lemonade. He said, oh, <coughs> excuse me? The man said, yeah. He said, I got the best pork chops you ever had. The pastor said, uh, I'm sorry. But he says, you know, as a, as a people, we, you know, et cetera, we, we, we don't eat certain things that the Bible declares as unclean, one of them being a pig. And the man said, what? He said, no one ever taught me this. And you know what that man decided to do? He not only ended the lunch, he ended his relationship with the church. And he ended up walking away. He said, you people deceived me. We're not doing anybody any favors withholding what our movement believes. That's not the way you win souls. That was not the example that Christ left for us. You do not tuck away and hide and all these things, the vital distinctive truths of what we believe. We owe it to the community to say, this is what we believe. Here's the reasons why. And this is why we, were, we are asking you, do you see this light? And is it your desire to be part of this movement? But today there's some strange methods of witnessing that are coming in that are trying to tell us, just compromise truths, move this away, move that away, et cetera. That's not the answer. The answer is not looking at our old way we used to witness that worked 50 years ago, and we're living in a totally different society today. Sometimes there might be certain principles that we can look at in the Word of God and say, you know what? It's okay to do some things differently. It's okay to restructure how our services are acting. It's okay to do certain things. It's not a violation of the Word of God. If you're going to get on to Catholics so much about tradition, you make sure that you're not a Seventh-day Adventist Roman Catholic. Sometimes, I'm not talking about truth. I'm not talking about principle. I'm talking about maybe there's a way that we go about worship that it's all right to make some changes because we live in a different time. And the goal is to reach the people. But even in both of those scenarios, what is Christ saying? Jesus says, your words must match your life. And I'm talking about the life we live when no one's looking. That's what I'm talking about, family. I'm not talking about how well we can act in front of each other and how clear we could say certain things to each other. No, I'm talking about when you're by yourself with your phone and 5G. What are you looking at? And why are you looking at it? And I'm not here to condemn you if you're looking at wrong stuff. What I'm saying is, is that, listen, Understand, Jesus wants to pour so much power into his church. He really wants to pour power so that we can be very, very effective witnesses. But the more that we indulge darling sins, even if we keep it a secret, it will void our power. 
We won't have the power. And you might know the doctrine. You might be able to prove Sabbath backwards and forwards, but there'll be no power with it. And you know what the demons will say? Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? The vagabond Jews did not have a wrong message. They were just in a wrong condition. Are you following that, beloved? When you read Acts 19, pay attention to it. It did not say that they gave some foul, strange doctrine. The problem was is they were vagabonds. The word vagabond in the Greek means vacillating. They weren't settled. Demons are not afraid of people that are not settled. Demons are afraid of people like Jesus who was settled. Demons are afraid of people like Paul who was settled. Paul says, I will die for this message and I will die for the messenger who gave it to me. That's what helps give our words power when we witness. That's what gave Jesus power. Let's bring it to a close. <sighs> Two ways our words can negatively affect our witness. Two ways our words can negatively affect our witness, beloved. The Bible says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Then it gives an example. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. James 3, 8 and 9. You know what that is? You know what we call that? That's about how we talk about others. Did you know our words can damage our witness by how we talk about others? One minute we're blessing God. The next minute we're cursing men who were made after the image of God and who God died for. I especially am talking to husbands and wives. You know why I'm doing that? My wife said something to her sister yesterday. You know, we were gone for our anniversary, and I cannot tell you how sweet that time was. Oh, brothers and sisters. <laughs> I wish I could just get a little, was it Elijah, where you stop the clock? You know, just stop the sun. Like, just don't let the days continue, right? It's just, you know, we had a, we had a really wonderful time, and we had a wonderful time celebrating 26 years of love. 26 years of love, okay? And my wife has this little habit that she has. When she talks to other women, um, my wife will go ahead and say things like, you know, yeah, my husband and I went away and da da da. And then this lady, she was with a lady yesterday, and, and the lady uh, and her were talking about anniversaries. So my wife said, yeah, our 26 years. And she said, oh, oh yeah, I, me and my husband have been together for 32 years. And then my wife said, is your husband your best friend? And the sister paused. It was like it, it caught her off guard. She was like, oh. and then what did she do next? She looked at her daughter <laughs> to make sure, like, did my daughter just hear that? And then she says to her, sometimes. <laughs> In other words, family, my wife was talking about how much she and I are best friends. We're, we're the best of friends. I mean, we talk all the time. Even if we drive out the house and go to the store, we'll call each other on the road to the store just to go ahead and talk. Best friends. If your wife is your best friend, if your husband is your best friend, how do you talk about other people with each other? Could the other person be there and walk away with the right interpretation of how you feel about them? Or would they, would they be there and say, wow, <laughs> OK. You know what I learned? I learned I'm a witness even to my wife. You know what I learned? My wife is a witness to me. And one of the things that can negatively affect our witness is how we talk about people. One minute we're blessing God, oh, how good God is, and then we're absolutely slandering other people. Brothers and sisters, that could affect your witness. Then what if it's not our spouses? What if it's the friends and other family members? You know, some people talk negatively about other people in front of their children. Do you know what our children start thinking? Man, if, if the next time they show up at church, you think they have the maturity to filter through those thoughts like you do? They're going to see elder so-and-so, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, and they're going to be like, yep, 
My dad said that about him. My mom said that about her. Did you know you're a witness to your children? Do you know it's very important? You have to be careful how you talk about other people, especially in front of your kids. They're paying more attention than we probably realize. God says, please, remember. You see, Jesus' words and his life were in harmony, and that's what gave power to witness. You and I don't want to bless we God one moment and then curse we men the next moment who were made after the similitude of God. For Jesus says, whatsoever you did or did not do to the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Prayerfully think about it, family. How do you talk about other people? It can affect your witness. Lastly, I only said two. If any of you lack wisdom, the Bible says, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What is our lesson here? Doubting after professing. That can affect your witness. One minute we're telling our family, the Lord is leading us. The Lord is good. The Lord is faithful. And then something bad happens and we say, what is God doing? He has no idea what he's doing. He is confused. One minute, God is great. Something happens, all of a sudden, God is not so great. Those words can affect our witness. I've done this, family. My wake-up moment was 2016. Dwayne Lemon, the evangelist, Dwayne Lemon, the preacher, Dwayne Lemon, whatever. And here it is that once I found out what was going on with my heart and thought I was going to die, I cursed God. Oh, I'd preach for you. I'd get stabbed in the back a thousand times for you. I, I, I. And all of a sudden, this is how you pay me back. And you know what God said with love? <laughs> he says, Dwayne, did you hear yourself? And I was like, oh. Ah. I can't believe I said this. And then God lovingly said, it was always there. And that brought me to tears. God was like, son, this, is, this didn't come out of you. Suddenly, it was always in you. And all that happened was a crisis that was strong enough came to bring out of you what was already in you. You see, when you curse somebody out, when you threaten and do all those things, it's because it was already in us. All that happened is the right agitation came and brought it out of us. Beloved, this is hindering us from receiving gospel power. These idols, these corruptions, these things that are deep in our hearts, God is saying, this is keeping you from being that powerful witness for me that I've called you to be. You see, the last message of love, hope, and warning to be given to the world will not be given by actors. It will not be given by people who know not the experience. You see, the three angels' messages, and I learned this a long time ago. It's one of the best things I ever learned in my life. The three angels' messages is not something I must know. It must be something I'm experiencing. Are you experiencing the everlasting gospel in the context of that first, that second, and that third angel, beloved? Are you experiencing the power in those messages? What is God saying to you in message number one, message number two, and message number three? If you're going to help people get out of a confusing place, maybe you and I should get out of a confusing place in our own lives. You understand that? And the best news in the world is this is what God says. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. 
Why is it that this needs to be our focus? Because God promises out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. I don't want you to leave here saying, well, let me just change my words around my husband now. Let me just change my words around my wife. I'm telling you, that is a futile effort. If you do that, it's only going to last for a season. And you and I will be back to our old original ways. What we need to do is plead with God to say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I need a new heart. I need to change. I need to become a different individual. And I need to do it for thy name's honor and glory. And I promise you, family, I promise you, if you start here, you will end up with the right words. And by the grace of God, like Jesus, our words and our lives will match. And may God give you power to be effective witnesses for him, like God gave Jesus power, that he was an effective witness for his father. Question, how many of us understood our study? Did we understand our study today? Amen. Is it your desire to say, you know, if you say, Lord, it's my desire. Lord, I want to be an effective witness for you. I want to witness like Jesus witnessed, my words and my life being in harmony by your grace and by your power. God will do it. So let's stand to our feet together. Let's have a word of prayer. And let's ask the Lord, Lord, please do this great work in me that only you could do. And may your name be glorified. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, that once again you came through and you taught us not merely how to pray, not merely how to study, but how to witness. And Lord, I pray that that excellent example that Jesus left for us in seeking to save that which was lost, please, Lord, let it be our experience, I pray. Help us, Father, that our words and our heart will be blended one with the other. And may it all come as a result of the power of your spirit, giving us a new heart, a new mind, new ways. And we pray you, praise you and thank you for hearing our prayer to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.